being here. Way big 16 people. Incredible. Incredible as always. Um, I'm kind of happy to say, man, I'm so proud of us. Um, pretty much halfway from today, we're going to be halfway through the book, which is epic. This is a big, thick book. Um, and I'm going to take you through, for the next maybe five-ish minutes, we're just going to kind of review what we've done so far, so that we can kind of just like remember everything. Um, first and foremost, though, I hope you're all blessed and feeling grounded and well. It's good to see you all, as always. Um, life is just getting madder and madder, man. CO2, that's a whole different story. Anyway, let me just do what I always do, um, my disclaimer. As always, so this is going to be our study, and today we're going to be talking about the science of Buddhism um, and the science of chanting, part three, and it's going to take us to halfway of the book. Um, but as always, let me just disclaim that this isn't an SGI meeting, and the author, Johnny Gilbert, never asked me to do this. Super important that people know that you're just taking a ride with me. So anyway, let me let me let me let me let's look at the first half of this book so far. I've wrote some little bits of notes I was, I was just like looking over it over the last few days and um whenever i read a book and i really adv advise this as well there's some great guidance especially if it's something that you really want to um embody you should read a book three times now obviously it's like it's, it's difficult i have the opportunity to do that quite easily i can read quite fast i can read a book in about three days de depending on the size um but the first time you read a book you just enjoy it it's just like going to blockbusters going to the cinema just enjoy the actual experience the second time you do what we're doing together now you kind of study it if you can get together with someone if not get a highlighter and just like you kind of just study it and like bits that pop out to you bits that resonate maybe just write some notes in the book that's the second time and then the third time depending on the kind of book so if it's a novel or like a fable like if it was like the celestine prophecy one of my favorite books on the planet by james redfield you would imagine that you're the main character i think his name was john or will so the third time you read it you truly embody it it's like you, you imagine that you're the person getting on the plane to peru and you've got the responsibility of finding the nine prophecies and so you really put yourself in that person's position because that way you've already embodied all of the knowledge for fun you've then studied it and then the third time you're really imagining it was you and i swear to god like that really is part of the reason i think i can kind of speak for it for days is because the amount of times i've done that to really big books and so it really is in me i embody it and then on top of that i'm chanting that instead of reading this and studying this with my head i'm studying it with my heart so it's really like it's really my whole essence um so yeah let's 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 go over the first half so the first section we um we talked about was it was called the lotus sutra the king of sutras now, obviously, the King of Sutras, it was, um, well, I've wrote it here, actually. It was the final masterpiece of 40 years of what Shakyamuni kind of did. It was like the masterpiece of Shakyamuni's life was the Lotus Sutra. And I believe it was the last eight years of his life that he kind of taught what we're studying today. And as Nichiren Buddhists, what is the book that we kind of, um, we take our teachings from. Now, we also covered that, and many people don't know this, but the sutras from Shakyamuni were actually five to 700 years after he actually passed. So he talked about how actually it was like, it was actually, Buddhism is a, it's like a heritage of ideologies that have been passed on from the original Shakyamuni, but it was, it was never actually him who wrote that down. Um, what else did I write here? Okay, this is when I bring in the famous Sally Smith always. This is, um, let me find the actual, um, the, the page. I think it's on page 18. For me, the Lotus Sutra is uh, encapsulated in this quote. So let me find it myself in the book. So it says here, and I'm going to change it again to Sally Smith. I'm sorry, I always use you. It's just it rolls off the tongue too easy. So Sally Smith is therefore the treasure tower itself. And the treasure tower is Sal Sally Smith herself. No other knowledge is purposeful. You may think you offered gifts to the treasure tower of the thus come one many treasures, but that is not so. You offer them to yourself. So it was in that quote where I think the power of the Lotus Sutra is revealed. It is us that are Buddhas. It is not these external deities and priests. It's Sally Smith, it's it's Kez, it's Joanne, you know, it's, it's us. So yeah, that was chapter one and it was a big chapter to jump into. That's when I was thinking, did I pick the wrong book? My God, this is deep, but we're here and I know I know it's resonating. Um, so chapter two was Nichiren, the ordinary Buddha. We kind of talked about actually the man in the latter day of the law, the period of time when Shakyamuni passed away, where we're the most disconnected from our spirit, we talked about <clears throat> Nichiren, a man that was born in 1222 in, in uh, 13th century Japan, 
and um, he was an ordinary Buddha. He was an ordinary man. He suffered until the, until the last day he died. You know, he, some of his last writings, he's talking about how he felt uncomfortable. He felt ugly. He wanted to go down to the village and like, and, and mingle. Um, so he talks about very much how he is an ordinary person. <clears throat> we also talked about how he was exiled to Sado Island. No, actually, yeah, well, he was exiled to Sado, Sado Island and the government tried to remove him in many ways. But there was a moment and we, um, we mentioned how in Tatsunokuchi, they tried to behead him basically illegally. Um, and this has been recorded in all different forms of Japanese kind of history, whether it's like the, the, the weather or um, earthquakes and stuff. They've, it's been recorded in all different moments. The moment that they went to strike his head off an orb went over the sky. Um, and this is not to try and make him seem mystical. Like all of us see orbs. All of us have had moments that have been like transcendental or something's like been like, yo, that feels like that was exactly for me. Like how did the entire universe do that for me in that moment? So this is like, I'm trying to break down the, the any mystical energy. It's just obviously if he's really revealing his life state it, to the highest potential, the universe is going to rock it and shake it even deeper. You know, remember like he's hitting it with the hammer. He's not hitting it with the, with the toothpick. So there was this moment and um, this is actually one of the most famous and my, the most beautiful quotes ever. Casting off the transient and revealing the true. So Nitrin, Nitrin, he casted off the transient version of himself. And in that moment, he realized, you know what? God damn it. I am actually a Buddha and we all are. But I don't see anyone else propagating Buddhism correctly. And like China's doing it incorrectly. All of like the Tibetan vibes, all of this incorrect. It's too external. It's giving all of these priests too much power. And so I'm going to cast off the transient version of myself and I'm going to make, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm going to reveal who I truly am. It's just like when a, when, when a caterpillar, that's the transient version of a caterpillar. It's like, you know, it's, um, it's ugly and it's like it's temporary but what but the true potential of the of the caterpillar is the beautiful beautiful uh, butterfly just like inside a, a blossom it's just a closed off blossom but the true potential is the cherry blossom that can that's always there dormant and that's the same of all of us but you have to believe it so yeah casting off the transient and revealing the truth that was when they tried to behead him and then they couldn't behead him and so every, literally the, the the samurai that was going to do it he literally became his follower he dropped to his knees and dropped the sword but again, not mystical, just very in tune with the, with, with the universe. Um, so then chapter three was Nam Harenge Kyo, which we're on now. We've done part one and two, uh, the roar of a lion. Uh, so I've wrote some notes here, which says Gongyu and Daimoku. So Daimoku is just the act of chanting. So when we're chanting for five minutes at the end, we're just called Daimoku as a, as a Buddhist. So Daimoku is a ceremony in which our lives commune with the universe. So that's very spiritual. That's the spiritual side of it. Uh, but what does that mean from a... Uh, scientific perspective that's kind of what we're going to go into finally today and round it up today um so the daimoku not only reveals a life state within us but it is itself the most essential aspect of our life that was something that really hit me so when we're chanting it's not only revealing a life state within us but nami horenge kyo is an essential aspect of our life um that really hit me we also mentioned and we spoke a little bit about how we there was there's been experiments and this is more to do with the science but like if uh, you've got two best friends we talked about this last week or two people that love each other or if people that are just in tune with each other you could literally put one in australia and uh one in the uk in electromagnetically sealed rooms and uh, you could flash a light in my eye and the neuro the neurology of my best friend in australia it would flash up instantaneously faster than the speed of light and so we kind of started to touch on how science is making us all inseparable because sometimes and it definitely for me being someone who was born in the, like you know I was, I was born in the 20th century but you know what i mean um we're younger and we're not like the older seniors it helps me to deepen my faith to know that like yo when i'm chanting for someone well i kind of understand from a scientifical point of view how that's working how that energy might actually receive to them and maybe why they suddenly text me or you know that moment when someone you think someone's going to ring you the classic and then like they ring you and like you was like you're looking at your phone and then suddenly that but that's because we're so in tune and so and 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 you know what i mean so it's starting to understand this and make and take it away from being some like fantastical thing because the more you understand it the more you ground it into yourself the more you embody this information the more you become a buddha because you're 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 you're, you're casting off the transient version of yourself this the version of yourself that doubts yourself the version of yourself that thinks you're small or separate from everyone the more you know this the more you embody it the more you're coming from your heart space and you're no longer based on your lower chakras of survival and fear and worry the more you truly are in communication with the universe the more things fly the more electricity starts happening the more things synchronicities um so again that's why it's really beautiful to kind of to study i always say this faith practice and study you can you have to practice but the more you study it, it beefs up your, your your practice and the stronger your faith is of course both of them just go um so i'm going to just quickly just now mention what we're going to speak about today for the next 45 minutes um so it's part three of nam myoharenge or the science of chanting 
So I'm just going to read it off. The first one, can we trust all the research? What scientific evidence is there on the benefits of chanting? Would more scientific studies really prove how chanting works? It's all about the vibration, man. The universe, fine-tuning problems. Transcending differences. And can anyone benefit from chanting? That's a really beautiful one at the end. And if I have time, this is a book that I'm personally studying right now. It's called um, For the Leaders of the Future, Discussions on Youth by Daisaku Akida, who is the president of the, uh, the SGI. Be beautiful book. It's written to um, more the Japanese youth, to be honest, but I can interpret it pretty easily. And, uh, but there's a, there's a section here about um, reading, and I, want, I would love to read some of that at the end, just to try and really encourage people to read. I'll read let me just read one or two things I've quickly highlighted. Um, so I said... The, it's, it's a conversation between two people. It says, this time we'll discuss the joy of reading. And then Daisaku Akita says, okay, but I think many people nowadays find reading a chore rather than a pleasure, which I find so true. Uh, but one thing is clear. Those who know the great joy of reading have richer lives, broader perspectives than those who don't. Encountering a great book is like encountering a great teacher. Reading is a privilege known, not, uh, known only to human beings. Reading is a journey. You can travel east, west, north and south and become acquainted with new pl people and places. Um... So that's just uh, a little something. Uh, and if I've got time, then I will definitely go back to this. Like, I love this part here. The foundation for everything in my life was forged during my youth. Um, so we're all in our youth. And it's, um, it's so proud of us all for trying to find the deeper questions in life. But let me uh, now share my screen and let's start this. Um, I might be a bit glitchy today because I don't have Chris with me. So I have to kind of also do all the technical as well. So just if you can bear with me slightly. But we out here. Um, cool. We good, Angelina? Everything blessed? Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> cool. So, part three, the science of chanting. So, President Daisaku Akita's dialogues with numerous eminent scientists, including chemist Linus Pauling, physicists Joseph Rotblat and cosmonaut Alexander Serebrov have set SGI on an open-minded path to engage with science. For the scientifically minded, hard evidence proven in the laboratory may be a prerequisite for giving any practice or method credibility and trustworthiness. As touched on earlier, the persuasive, in, the pervasive influence of mindfulness in the result in the, is the result of scientific research combined with a secularization of the product on offer. The downside, arguably, being a co commodification of the practice disembodied from a moral code and its philosophical roots. So, has there been any similar research on chanting in general, and specifically Nam Myoharenge Kyo, and can it provide further insight and support for this particular model of practice? Can we trust all of the research? Before examining some of the scientific investigations into chanting, it is important to highlight some of the problematic issues of studies in this field. As noted earlier, Farise and Wick Wickholm have re-evaluated the research on mindfulness, examining over 4,000 articles and found the vast majority of studies were of poor quality, lacking a proper control group. They concluded that uh, they concluded there was no robust scientific evidence that mindfulness had substantial effects on our mind and behaviours. Control groups are an essential part of any fair test in order for scient scientists to examine conditions in the absence of the factor they are testing. Control, control groups are easy to establish when testing a new drug. A placebo drug is provided to the participants. But with meditation research, to create a control group by requiring the participants to do an alternative activity such as resting or exercising will likely lead to the group knowing that they have been placed in the placebo group. This means the expectations of the participants get mixed up with the results. In addition, these expectations are rarely evaluated before meditation research. There is also the risk of high hopes on the part of the scientists to find a positive outcome, discounting neutral results and sexing up any minor differences, something Faraz and Wickholm have also evidenced. In addition, it is important to avoid a sampling bias. For example, examining only those who have experience of meditation may not reflect the makeup of the population as a whole in terms of ethnicity, social class and mental health profile. All of these difficulties are encapsulated in the greatest body of research on a form of mantra meditation, transcendental meditation, TM for short. TM rose to prominence in the 1960s and 1970s with the initial public support for the, of the Beatles. 
Its founder, the Maharishi Maharesh Yogi, encouraged scientific studies in the 1970s and 1980s to support its main technique, which involved the silent internal meditative technique of chanting a, uh, a given mantra in one's head. The TM research claimed a wide range of benef uh, health benefits related to stress, anxiety, depression, burnout, and even wider soci societal impacts in grand experiments involving TM's effect on crime rates across a whole city. However, a systematic review by Lynch et al. of the uh, Royal College of Physicians in Ireland of 2,171 records, of which 78% of the studies utilised the TM programme, found 90% of the studies were of poor quality, hindering the extent to which one could be confident of the accuracy of their findings. What scientific evidence is there on the benefits of chanting? Compared to the dludge of research on mindfulness that has been produced in the past decade, Research on chanting is, uh, in general is at a nascent stage and much of what has been investigated slips into the pitfalls outlined above. The most rigorous piece of research on Buddhist chanting so far was carried out by the University of Hong Kong in 2019, a blip on a different form of chanting. Brain waves are one of the most tangible factors that can be analysed for the effects of religious or therapeutic intervention. They are generated by electrical impulses working in unison via a fast network of neurons interacting with one another. Brain waves are categorised into five main uh, bandwidths. The slowest of these are delta waves, which occur, but not exclusively so, during deep sleep. The fastest are gamma waves, prevalent in conscious perception. Alpha brain waves have been found to increase in experiments on mindfulness meditation, but also manifest in all forms of wakeful relaxation when our eyes are closed. Brain waves are monitored using an EEG, which can measure electrical activity in the brain through the placing of electrodes across the scalp. It is important to, to avoid unverified generalization about the purpose of different brain waves. Scientists are not all in agreement in this field. And furthermore, a number of New Age writers have manipulated the science to ascribe various qualities to each brain wave, which do not stand up close to examination based on the research. The University, the University of Hong Kong study used two active control groups, one who repeated the religious chant silently and the other who chanted the Chinese tr translation of Santa Claus, Old Man, to control for the potential effect of chanting just any phrase that comes to mind. The group who were chanting a Buddhist mantra aloud showed a greater increase in delta brainwaves in comparison to the two control groups. The researchers state that accumulated evidence suggested delta waves may be related to reduction of self-orientated thoughts and the temporary awareness of our senses. Due to the fact delta waves are prevalent in sleep, they also likely have a restorative function for the brain and organs. Gemma Perry of Macquarie University, Australia, has found a positive effect on mood and social cognition from vocal chanting, but her study only used silent chanting as a control comparison. The chanting of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo has not received, as far as I'm aware, any similar EEG studies. The two authors, jointly, two authors jointly have put themselves under EEG analysis during the chanting of the Daimoku. The first experienced an increase in delta and theta brain waves during testing, and the second an increase in alpha and theta waves, which crossed over during the recitation. And I'll tell you all now as well, that is the, the authors they're talking about is uh, Susanna and Yukio Matsudo. And it's the book that I'm always talking about, Change Your Brainwaves, Change Your Karma. Um, and the only reason that, you know, and I respect this and he talks about it more, it's only because the two authors, they've only done the experiments pretty much on themselves. Like the husband and wife, they've gone to Germany or Japan and done it themselves. And so obviously on like a large scale, you couldn't use that as a like scientific evidence. You'd have to do it to thousands of people in controlled groups and stuff. But for me, it is undeniable and absolutely insane and the photos that they've took of the uh, the light body before and after chanting is mind-blowing I've, I've known you've known i'm like a rabbit rabbiting on you've heard me say this so many times the aura is truly filled out um and that's what i guess it means to be in like you know to to have that commune with the universe you are lifted into the ether let's say and um every seven chakras are literally normally when you're stressed or your anxiety or if you've done no sage and nothing if you're just out here just living life no spiritual activity your chakras are really small closed off and they're like all over the place displaced but literally only 10 minutes of chanting they're all in alignment and they start to open up and um that's what starts to bring in the synchronicities the um the, the karma starts to change and that's I, and it's so powerful for me especially uh, chanting for six years and never really having the science and then finding all these books in 2020 and in lockdown and reading all the science of it and really starting to understand how crazy it is and um there's I, I, someone told that this is again you couldn't use this as a scientific 
kind of as proof but there was i can't remember what team it was but it was a football team that got t- taken over by a chinese buddhist man once in i think it was like bolton or leicester and um like they had no chance of ever getting to like the top of the league and he made like all of them pray buddhist like a buddhist like it wasn't nami haringe cure but they chanted something and like they, they went to the top of the league like within a year and it was like unbelievable you have to research it literally it's a google thing like british team that had buddhist manager and it's like it's, it's just crazy and it's like so many stories like that um but obviously we have to respect the deep science and we're trying to prove it on a massive scale um so that's why he's, he mentions here um He's not aware of like any EEG studies, even though it has happened. And it's, but it's only the two authors. So I deeply recommend that book, um, Change Your Brain Waves, Change Your Karma 3.1. So anyway, let me carry on. Two authors jointly have put themselves under EEG analysis during the chanting of the Daimoku. The first experienced an increase in delta and theta waves during testing, and the second an increase in alpha and theta waves, which crossed over during the recitation. This alpha-theta crossover is associated with a hypnogonic state between waking and sleeping and is advocated in neurofeedback therapy to produce tra- uh, to process trauma and addiction with no control groups and such limited number of participants involved however nothing conclusive can be proven from these results which i have to respect of course certainly it is only a matter of time before a fuller neuroimaging study of the chanting of the daimoku is performed at university level so that's amazing and we're the generation that are going to be proving this would more scientific studies really prove how chanting works Whoa, I, I highlighted a lot here. I must have been happy. Uh, <laughs> um, but even if a vigorous and comprehensive study was conducted, engaging the brain waves of chanting Nam Myoho Renge Cure, would this, really be requ- would, this, would this really be required to validate the practice? Chanting and practicing SGI Buddhism are far more than achieving altered states in the brain. It is about achieving our determinations, our relationships with others, and our deep personal change which manifests in daily life. We tend to latch on to the most tangible scientific evidence based on a testable hypothesis method which has its roots and clearest expositions in chemistry and physics. When dealing with a chemical reaction or an electrical event in the brain, experiments can achieve a clear-cut answer. Yet, there are many aspects of life, psychology, social science and behavioural sciences which are equally important but less unequivocal in their outcomes. For example, these later sciences will often ask participants in studies to complete a survey about their views and feelings, but these may garner subjective results based on the individual's mood that day, the expectations and experience of being in a scientific study, and even if they have time to have a good breakfast beforehand. Sometimes results from such research can be approached in the media with the same scientific absolutes as the results from a test tube or a petri dish. Scientists can be viewed as the high priests of our contemporary society, but the scientific method means new evidence can disprove old findings and conclusions can be overturned. It is in these life science that the full benefit of Buddhist practice can be examined, but we must be wary of making absolute judgments on their findings. As it is so beautifully illustrated in Nichiren Buddhism, our lives are made up of a complex web of internal and external causes. In attributing a cause to any particular result, there will be a myriad of other causes that also led to the outcome. In addition, there is the concept in Buddhism of latent and manifest effects. A cause, we make na- uh, a cause we make now may not manifest immediately, just as an acorn planted today will not grow in a beautiful. In, it won't grow into a beautiful oak tree tomorrow. How could a study of the effects of chanting account for such delays, result delayed results as a latent effect? The geographer Jared Diamond compares proximate causes the surface triggers for events and actions with ultimate causes the deep causal origins of an event he uses the example of a marriage counseling session where the husband attributes the breakup of their marriage to the wife slapping him in the face whereas the wife attributes it to the husband having affairs digging deeper the husband may may attribute the affairs to his wife's coldness and his wife might attribute her coldness to the husband's lack of attention to her this could go on and on, but f- above all, for Nichiren Buddhists, the ultimate cause is the chanting of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, and therefore the manifestation of our truest, purest self, our Buddha nature. As Nichiren states, it is impossible to fathom one's karma. If we could split our lives in two, such as in the classic Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and examine how our life transpired when chanting and without chanting, then we would truly evaluate the effects. As that is never going to happen, we must satisfy ourselves with examining our own responses to the difficulties of life after practicing Buddhism and the overall trajectory our life takes. This is the actual proof we can all test in the laboratory of our own lives. As it made clear by Nichiren Anakida, struggles and problems will not vanish once an individual takes up Buddhism, nor will life be easy. 
Buddhism's power is manifest in how one deals with the inevitable challenges when they occur. And that, for me, I remember reading this, not from this book, but at the beginning. It's just why it worked for me, the idea of Buddhism. And, you know, I'm a very open-minded people. I do loads of things, but my heart and my soul and I am a true, true Buddha and Bodhisattva. And that's my main practice. And the reason I, I do that and I chant every day, I've done like an hour and a half today, um, is because of that last sentence. Buddhism's power is manifest in how one deals with the inevitable challenges when they occur. Um, and as, as it's made clear, struggles and problems will not vanish once an individual takes up Buddhism. And when someone told me that, I think it was like the first day I walked into the center, they were like, yeah, boy, you know, all your problems, you're still going to have problems, boy. It's a Jamaican man. And I was like, I love that because it was like, it's not no joke. You know, we have to take full responsibility. Life is inevitable problems. If you think you can just transcend and like become a fairy or, you know, like, and, and obviously it's about having less problems and turning the poison of our life into medicine. And it's not, and, 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 but it just, it's the idea that it's just becoming like resilient, like Mount Fuji. That's why I like my, my brand, Indigo Child, I, it's, it's a mountain with Nitrin, little Nitrin monk looking at, at the mountain. Cause it's like, yo, we're going to have continuous mountains to climb for the rest of our lives. But at least with a strong practice and at least if we can be in the in the orbit of buddhahood in the universe we can we can always conquer that and we can always be in our highest life state and, and and we can create some magic as well and some really beautiful experiences but it was just that strictness that like yo there's no practice out there that's going to make you maybe you could transcend it but there's people out there that will live in a tree for 40 years and then they'll come back and like there's like you know like if you're still human it's about being human and and taking full responsibility so i really love that man buddhism's power is manifesting how one deals with the inevitable challenges when they occur like I'm, I'm doing this because there's a lot of challenges to come and it's like let's strengthen ourselves up and become the best that we can be it's not like let's all just like you know be the black sheep of the family like just tell everyone go away let's take some mushrooms and like let's just be in a different realm because life's too difficult we did not come here for that reason you know it's about how can we become the most resilient of mountains so anyway it's all about vibrations man a fine a final recent scientific theory is worth noting at this point in relation to brain waves and physical phenomena more generally Tam Hunt and Jonathan Schooler of the University of California, Santa Barbara, have recently proposed a resonance theory of consciousness. Consciousness. Hunt and Schooler posit, posit that resonance, another word for synchronized vibrations, is at the heart of physical reality. All things in the universe are constantly vibrating. Every object in the room you are sitting in is vibrating at various frequencies. And on an ultimate level, all matter is a vibration of underlying fields. In addition to this view, Hunt and Schooler highlight that many things in proximity to each other start to sync up, to vibrate together at the same frequencies, from fireflies flashing their lights in sync to the complex neurons firing in the human brain. Hunt states, resonance is a truly universal phenomenon and at the heart of what can sometimes be seem, seem like mysterious tendencies towards a self-organisation. Could this universal tendency in phenomena to vibrate and sync in the future explain further the logic and power of chanting Nam Myoharengekyo? Pascal Fries, a German neuropsychologist, has explained how this synchronization process in gamma, theta and beta, uh, beta waves produce human consciousness. On a material level, it is the working together of these electrical waves that produce various types of human conscious experience. This does not resolve the difficulty in defining the ultimate source of consciousness, but Hunt and Schooler go further based on a pan-psychic, that's the wrong word, approach to consciousness outside the brain. Their view is that all entities are to some extent conscious, that consciousness is an inherent part of the universe and that through simple and through simpler elements combining into more complex elements through vibrational harmony, an example being the neurons that make up the brain, Ever more advanced manifestations of consciousness occur. The universe's fine-tuning problem. The likelihood of the universe existing of itself with all the laws of physics in perfect balance is incredibly slim. J.M. Walsh describes 17 interdependent cosmological factors that must be at or near their observed values at and the chances of all of these functioning as they do to be a vanishingly small probability. The issue of the cosmological factors is known as the fine-tuning problem. The universe is fine-tuned for life to a statistically impossible degree. Scientists have developed mathematical theories of limitless multiple universes to allow for the chance of the universe and our planet to exist under such laws and even remoter outcome of the emergence of life. The multiple u universe theory can only remain a theory, however, because it is impossible to find or enter another universe. How the universe brought forth life in mind, we do not know. But the mind, uh, but the idea of a universe dynamically driven towards life and mind, a compassionate law, 
is an alternative theory gaining increasing acknowledgement from scientists and philosophers. It is a theory not as yet fully proven, but the multiple universe theory supported by many others can never be proven other than in mathematical models. Secular materialists see the idea of universal consciousness, an underlying dynamic law that produces life, as a dangerous threat and a return to the pre-Darian reliance on God. But giving space for the possibility that life and mind were in some way woven into the natural order from the beginning, as a, uh, Adrian Nelson puts it, does not require us to return to the religious dogma and superstitions of the past. The concept, the concept of a mystic law with some compassionate intent makes the dynamic development of life in the universe plausible and finds a place for mind and consciousness, whereas a purely mechanic, me mechanistic explanation does not. It also connects us with our environment and becomes a bias, uh, a basis of value in the world rather than casting us as isolated biological robots with no ultimate worth. Daisaku Akita has stated, in the universe itself, there is an, a unifying compassion. The universe itself is originally compassion. And the compassion of the universe is the function of the Buddha. When we pray, speak out, and take action for the happiness of a friend, the eternal life of the universe manifests, manifests through our thoughts, words, and deeds. Based on the evidence I have outlined earlier in this chapter, I believe it is fair to remain open to the existence of this compassionate intent. And, as Akira outlines, through compassionate actions, we attune with this underlying law. For Nichiren Buddhists, the quintessential of this compassionate law is revealed in nam myo ho renge kyo Transcending differences. But if this mystic law, all-pervading consciousness or mind, is a universal aspect of existence infused everywhere and an aspect of all of us, can nam myo ho renge kyo be an exclusive means to connect with this universal element or are there other means? SGI sees Nichiren as have, having fully fused with the ultimate law of life and he recognised this, that this law could be fully expressed in the current age as nam myo ho renge kyo But equally, Akita's engagements outside SGI in dialogues with those of other religions express a sympathy with the universe's universal message found in all religions and, as, as, and a desire to transcend differences. Akita, in elaborating on Toda's views, hypothesizes that if Muhammad, Jesus and Nitrin had been able to meet, they would have quickly been able to reach agreements on the way forward, differences only having arisen among their later followers. Steve Taylor describes how the Lakota Native American tribe called the spirit force they believed in as Wakan Tanka, which more accurately can be translated as the great mystery, a divine force, not a sacred being, much like the concept of the mystic law. J.M. Walsh refers to other SGI publications in which the authors acknowledge that all major religions seek the same reality and that the SGI does not claim exclusive truth. My perspective on this question was coloured by my spiritual crisis which I referred to earlier in the chapter. Whilst I was meditating heavily and chanting minimally, I went on what can be only described as a spiritual shopping tour participating in a variety of retreats, seminars and services from Hindu, Christian and other forms of Buddhism. Although I enjoyed each one and saw a spiritual connection manifest each time, none came close to the warmth, support and engagement I had found in SGI meetings. My conclusion, therefore, was that there are many ways to access the universal, ultimate reality, but that nam myo ho renge kyo is a particularly refined and accessible method, combined with a practical and reasonable philosophy, which can result in a major positive impact on the, uh, in, on the individual and society. And I'm going to read that one part like, one more time because this is really, I really love this and I'm not here trying to make, and I talk about Buddhism to everyone and I always say to them, I ain't trying to make you into a Buddhist, this is what works for me. And Johnny really put it into words that uh, is going to help me to articulate this so it's not like, you know, I'm some heavy Buddhist guy, like I'm trying to be Buddha heavy. It's, um, there's, there are other ways, but I, it's when he says this here. My conclusion, therefore, was that there are many ways to access the universal ultimate reality, but that nam myo ho renge kyo is a particularly refined and accessible method, combined with a practical and reasonable philosophy, which can result in major positive impact on the individual and society. So I love that. Can anyone benefit from chanting? So can anyone who chant benefit, whether or not they are connected to a spiritual organization such as SGI? My answer to this would be yes, but with a caveat, most illustrated by a quote from Nitrin's writings. How great is the difference between the blessings received when a sage chants, the Daimoku, and the blessings received when we chant it? And a sage being someone like the Dalai Lama or Nitrin himself or um, the Buddha, 
you know. So how great is the difference between the blessings received when a sage chants Nam Yo Kyo and the blessings received when Sally Smith chants Nam Yo Kyo? To reply, one is in no way superior to the other. The gold that a fool possesses is in no way different from the gold that a wise man possesses. And that's not to say you're a fool, Sally Smith. <laughs> However, there is a difference if one chants to Daimoku while acting against the intent of the sutra. So that's what it means. You know, there are many different people that chant Nami Horenge Kyo. You know, like we spoke about this, I think, on the first time, uh, the first call. Like, you know, they, they, they're called Nichiren Shoshu. And they, they still believe that, you know, the, they have the true lineage of Buddhism going all the way back to Shakyamuni, which we've already proven can't happen because, you know, the, the sutras were written 500 years from when he was even about. So they've all, they're, they claim to be true Buddhism is already kind of incorrect. Not to slander them, um, but... Uh, it's saying here, and, it's, and and to make this software, it doesn't specifically mean you have to join the SGI, but with the spirit of what we're doing in the SGI, which is right now in the spirit, it's making sure that we're chanting in the true intent of the sutra. And the true intent of the sutra, as we know, is the true dignity of life of every single individual working together uh, as a bunch of potatoes in a sack with all the skins on and how does the skins become pure you keep rubbing them against each other and it starts to just take off all the skins of the potato that's what we're doing right now we're rubbing against each other and just lifting up our karma and revealing it and obviously it's much more in depth when you're together with people um changing the world through having heart-to-heart -heart dialogue making sure you're empowering every single individual and um respecting every single one not trying to judge people you know recognizing everyone's having a a, a myriad of human experiences um so that's what it means here and so again like, like to soften it it doesn't specifically mean join the sgi but to be in the intent of why the sgi exists how hard they've tried to make sure that they um preserve true buddhism and offer it to us now in the 21st century um I'm Eddie Capone, one of my greatest um, like human mentors that I have physically in my life. He's like 74 years old and uh, he's a, one of the first black Buddhists in the UK. He always tells me, he was like, brethren, he's Jamaican. He's like, you have to imagine Nitrin, he, imagine he had a glass and it was filled right to the top. Yeah, he had to make, and of water, that's his teachings from 800 years ago, the 13th century. He had to pass this all the way to me in Southwest London without dropping one drop in 800 years. If one drop was, was uh, fell out, his teachings are impure. And um, and it, that's where that, you know, and there's been many drops that have no doubt come out, but it's the SGI, it's it's um, Tusaburu Makaguchi, Jose Toda and Daisaku Akida after World War Two and during World War Two that literally just like went bunness. Let's look at all of the teachings of Buddhism and really save the people now and like go back to the, to the truth, because, uh, you know, we can't be having like the government like telling us that we should like be praying for the destruction of the West. It doesn't go with, you know, there was so much that they were going through. So, um so yeah we had to that's why it's so important that the, the true heritage of buddhism is like passed on without it being contaminated and it's all about the dignity of the human that was what the lotus sutra was talking about and that was what i believe very much shakamuni would want us to, to to do now it's not pray to me what kind of egoic like person would be like yo i've, I've found enlightenment now i want people two thousand years on to just keep on praying to me like come on he wanted us to be like him he wanted us to walk the way he walked to love the way he loved to see the world the way he saw we uh, he saw it and to absolutely Absolutely. Um, and it's the same with Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon him. Fundamentally, you know, it's just unfortunately with these like Western religions, it's all a madness. Like, you know, like people don't even realize that the letter J didn't exist when Jesus was alive. So like, it's been such a twisted thing um, that people don't realize. And um, and of course, with Buddhism, it's been corrupt in many ways. Um, but I would, I would give my life fully. And I truly, I truly trust that. Yeah. Um, we're starting to find the truth of it now and the tr and as we move into the age of aquarius it's, it's about time that the truth comes back to us you know um because it's been way too manipulated so one more time how how great is the difference between the blessings received when a sage chants to daimoku and when maria chants to daimoku to reply one is in no way superior to the other the gold that a fool possesses is no way different from the gold that a wise man possesses however there is a difference if one chants to daimoku while acting against the intent of the sutra so if you're chanting for malevolent reasons you're chanting for darkness or if you're chanting for something that even though you think it's positive but it's not in true it's not the true intent of the universe um then it, it, it it's going to manifest differently for you um or, or it won't manifest you know uh, i wouldn't know i've always chanted in the true intent of the sutra um so the chapter on the lotus sutra looks at this in more depth but that intent can be summarized as the philosophy of the dignity of life therefore chanting in isolation may be beneficial and it is trust me i'm saying this to all of you right now like this is the time to be chanting in isolation we're in lockdown kind of energy and stuff um but at the same time 
someone give me a phone call and let's chant on zoom simultaneously i'll chuck you on mute and then we'll like if you can chant with people and obviously in in when the world starts to fluff up you know there's nothing better than being around a campfire and praying with everyone chanting with everyone like being in what we call a sangha and a sangha is a universal buddhist term for a community of believers you know so like being together that's how the potato skins clean themselves because you're rubbing up against each other and we start to polish each other's lives it's the most efficient way if you're just chanting on your own isolated very easy to become egoic very easy to no longer have something to be like a lighthouse because you're, you're, you're trying to like decode all of the teachings we don't need to decode the lotus sutra we don't need to decode um the uh the go show we've got we've got amazing people like um jose toda and people that have done it and also you can i've done it i read and to be honest at this point i'm reading i'm reading the uh the some of Nitrin's words where he talks about like yo in the latter day of the law your politicians are going to be like like um demons and devils i'm like well, i think i should take this a little bit more seriously maybe he wasn't actually like you know using metaphors but you know you got you got to analyze it as much as you can in your own heart so uh therefore chanting in isolation may be beneficial but a wise organization uh, aligned with the intent of the sutra is really key to ensure that one is manifesting that intent to maximize the power of chanting it's about maximizing the power of chanting making sure that you always have strong people around you they always say give me five of your friends and i'll show you your future i'm telling you now i've only got five kings and queens around me so my future's looking good do you know what i mean like i don't hang around i don't, I don't keep dead weight around me i don't keep people that make me feel small around me i don't keep people that make me feel like i'm stuck in my lower chakras it's definitely time to empower ourselves to not slander our lives and to walk away from anything that does that because if you don't walk away from anything right now that is keeping you in your lower chakras that's keeping you in a in a position of fear and sometimes it means walking away but you still have to live right next door to them uh but it's about an energetic cut off it's like i'm not going to do this anymore because otherwise you are slandering your life you're slandering the treasure tower inside yourself because it's like you're saying do you know what yeah i don't really believe in the power of my life i'd rather just keep on taking this abuse do you know what i mean i just had this beautiful conversation with this lady this evening and she was uh, she's my waitress in the cafe and then she was like do you want to go and like have a um like a cigarette after and like and chat in the park and we was chatting and uh, she had a rip in her jeans. I was like, why is your jeans ripped? She was like, oh, the man who owns the calf, like he tried to grab me, um, her words, by the pussy. Um, and it ripped her jeans. And she's like, yo, I've, I'm just done with this, man. Like all, all my life I've been like, you know, I've, I've had like um, stuff happen to me, situations. I've been abused by my husband. And I looked at her and I smiled and I said, congratulations. She was like, what? I said, congratulations. The universe has now manifested this situation for you so that you can, do you now walk away? Do you go because she's telling me she's got business that she's got a business degree and she was she's an amazing chef and like she used to be like the, the owner of the metro uh, the manager of metro bank and shit and now she's like you know life got hard and she has to be a waitress and she's got all these like greek men like trying to touch her up and like like all this stuff to the grown-ass mother you know like got three kids and i just said to her do you know what yeah and i bring her back to my house i gave her nam your your card i was like i know you're catholic but like put, put this to your altar and um and i said you know what though you need to I'm, I'm telling you this you have to be strict because if you end up being raped next week you have to blame yourself and i know that's hard but the universe has given you some red flags like red flags if you walk away from them red flags if you slander your life by not quitting this job and thinking like oh i'm like I, like because i'm telling you the universe as difficult as it is and as scary you might have some rocky roads and some rocky days ahead but if you stand in your sovereignty and your power in your truth and in your heart and you don't accept anything like that anymore some some relationship where a partner doesn't even love you or doesn't even doesn't even want to have sex with you anymore whatever it is however flat you it's time to take your sovereignty back and what you want in life and if you don't you have to take responsibility and you have and you're slandering your own life and that's that's that I'm, I'm a strict when i give guidance personally you have to be ready for it i was like and she was like oh my god and then i was like let's I bring out the sage and I was like and then i softened it up a little bit but um it's very it's, it's very much about yeah man um taking responsibility and making sure that you are living your best life if you're doing something you know is not the best thing for you or it's not creating the best karma or the because everything in every moment is causes we're making in every second everything we're doing is a cause and remember everything is cause and effect that is buddhism and it's like and we're still living out effects from past lives i'm telling you that's what that's what um our karma is and our tendencies our personality it's all molded throughout lifetimes to this moment this zero point lifetime the most amazing lifetime to be alive by the way um so anyway i, I haven't got long um I have attempted to provide in this chapter some further perspectives on the chanting of Namya Harenge Kyo, some of which are indicated by science, and yet it is important to acknowledge the difference in perspectives that religions afford. It deals with consciousness in a way that science may never be able to, because we are the conscious observers, and the observer observing one's own consciousness is part of what scientists describe as the hard problem regarding consciousness. That sounded like a rap lyric. Um, instead, religion, and more specifically in this case, SGI Buddhism, 
come from a different angle, more eloquently summed up by Arnold Toynbee in his dialogue with Daisaku Akita, Choose Life. And fun fact, as a Buddhist, yeah, everyone loves this book, Choose Life. It's like this guy called Arnold Toynbee, who was like a really famous historian in the UK in like the 90s, 80s, 70s. Like he's one of the most world-renowned historians and Daisaku Akita came to the UK to meet him. So imagine this, I'm coming back from a big campaign in Spain. I'm, I, get on this tr I'm, get, I get on the plane, and I'm sitting on this plane. Some old man's sitting next to me. It's not Arnold Toynbee, he's dead now. But some old man's sitting next to me. And I just so happened to have the, um, the Art of Living magazine that I, I, I always talk about. But it was, it was called the UK Express and it was from the 70s. It was super old and I, re I collect old magazines so I can look at the photography because I do photography for the new one. So anyway, I'm sitting on this plane and this man's next to me and, and, and I'm looking and he's some grumpy old man, man. And he looks at me and he goes... I know that, that, that Japanese man. I said, what? He was like, yeah, my brother-in-law. He had a, he had a, I think he wrote a book or some kind of stupid book. I was like, what? I was like, your brother-in-law's Arnold Toynbee. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, the universe wants me to introduce Buddhism to him. I know it. I know it. Like, oh my God, I'm going to be the person that's going to shakabuku this guy. And so I said to him, I was like, and, and, and he loved the magazine because it was from the 70s, man. Like, I don't normally roll around with them. I, I normally have the ones from like the 21st century, but I just happened to go to like Spain or Italy, wherever it was. And, uh, and not just that, there was another SGI Buddhist on the, tra on, on, the, uh, on the plane. And I think someone had a heart attack on that plane. And then suddenly like two of us started chanting and like we was on the flight chanting hard to this guy having a heart attack. But the, the, the point is I sat next to Arnold Toynbee's brother-in-law who actually met Sensei. He was around, he, his own brother-in-law was the most amazing historian. He didn't care at all. He just wanted to drink wine and go on like these trips his whole life or whatever he was doing. And it was me who sat right next to him. The karma, everything's inseparable. Remember, everything's working. So there's, like it says earlier in the, in the chapter, there's some kind of self-organization happening in the universe. And it's just like, and then he was, he was so happy. I saw him like when I was going through the customs and of course I was getting checked and he got to walk straight through. But I was there just like getting checked, waving at him, going, yo man, take care. And he was like reading the, uh, the magazine. It was epic. And like I, when I tell other Buddhists that, they're like, oh. So um, so you can see by my excitement, it was a big deal for me. And I've got stories like that for days. With, like My actual proof is unreal, tr truly. So anyway, let me, this is the last chapter. Scientists limit uh, their objectives to observing phenomena, seeking to explain them rationally and trying to test their conclusions. In contrast to science, religion offers human beings a chart of the mysterious world in which we awoke to consciousness and which we pass our lives. Although this chart is conjectural, we cannot do without it. It is a necessity of life. So that was Arnold Toynbee who said that. Um, and he was just like to take on a Japanese Buddhist into your house in them days were amazing. Um, let me just read one or two quick quotes and then we'll chant. Because um, I just wanted to, again, just really encourage people to read this again and again and like because you studied it with me like the next time you read it, it's going to go through easy and even if and even if it's not this like the 3.1 book it's a lot smaller if you wanted to read something it's a lot smaller it's really fast um so i'm just going to read random like so i literally just highlight stuff so it might be all out of context but i've got a few minutes so i just want to so jose toda this is just a quote from jose toda who's passed away now in 1958 but he said i would finish my work as quickly as possible and hurry to an open field nearby where i would toss the cart aside lie down on the grass and read I love that. That's literally me, man. Um, youth. Make time in your heart to read and think seriously about things. It's a matter of setting your mind to it. Those who claim they have no time haven't really made room in their hearts to do so. When you're head over heels for someone, for instance, you want to see him or her whenever or wherever you can. Even if it's only a brief, uh, even if it's only a brief glance or just for five minutes, right? That should be your attitude to reading, and I love that. Um, you know that moment when you're in love or you're you're you're, you're with someone new for the first time, and like you just you, you just like you want to get off the bus or like you see them. Even if it's for five minutes, I'm gonna get a train for one hour, man. I've done it, man. There was one time I get all the, I go all the way to Paris only for two hours just because like oh this girl, man, and it's um and and it, they end up being foolish and annoying people anyway. And then and it's like why why didn't I just spend like the fourteen hours I, I was on the uh on the coach? I could have just been reading. So yeah, like it's, yeah, like that that. But it just proves to you that electricity. You know when people say, I ain't got time to read, it's all tired, man, because like they, they got time to be on Tinder, though. They got time to be on Call of Duty or Frontline or whatever the games that the youth play. I don't know. Like they got time for that. So it's like, even if you just read one page, um, it's really just amazing. Um, do you have any advice, Daisaku Akida, for people who want to read but don't know where to begin? Daisaku Akida says, rather than worrying about what to read, it's probably best to just read even one page of something. Indecisiveness will get you nowhere. At least if you read one page, you'll have made progress. Um, 
and like if anyone wants something fun to read which is not about buddhism but it's going to explain let's like the spirituality of what's happening now the awakening as in the 21st century all the synchronicities again um it's an amazing book there's so many deep truths in there um the celestine prophecy really love that book man um crucial is the determination to make wisdom passed down through the ages your own so that's why it's really important to read a lot about from other from other philosophers and religions and and it's about making that wisdom for me it's like bringing down that buddhist wisdom and making it my own and embodying it but in, in order to embody it you can't just read through it real quick on the train and then think you've read it because like you know it's like really with your heart read thoughtfully not passively i jotted these down in my notebooks as i was a youth don't read carelessly President Makaguchi, the first president of the SGI, said, you must ponder everything you read. It seems that many young people read but fail to think about the content. Thinking about what you read makes it a part of you. Um, yeah, man. What's the time? Cool. So, let's chant for five minutes. Uh. Oh, my God, my leg's dead. I need to hop. So always remember, we chant with our eyes open. The reason we chant with our eyes open is because we are not trying to transcend this reality. We're trying to shift this realm right here. And um, what can I suggest? Maybe we could do something slightly different today. So I'm gonna chant for five minutes, but maybe let's all, um, let's also, when we're chanting, just envision like a white light around us. And let's um, see ourselves being just grounded deeply into the earth in this moment together. Um, which is not, you're never going to hear this in a Buddhist meeting, by the way. This is me, yeah. But like, let's just imagine we're just grounded deep into the earth. And um, imagine yourself, yeah, just really as your best potential, as your best version, as who you really are. Not, not the transient version, my favorite quote. Yeah, cast of the transient, reveal the true. And know that the transient version of you, the lesser ego, the, the, the decisions you're making right now but that might not be coming from your highest life state, love that version of you because it's everything to get you to this part right now like it's everything and you can't be you without that and i ain't got time in my mental health to be worrying about or to be anxious about decisions i've made or paths that i'm currently on i can only this is what i love about buddhism it's about this moment and the future the past is done run the thing obviously we're going to learn about the past we've got to know about who, where we you can't know where you are if you don't know where you've come from but the most fundamental thing is the present moment is all we've got. So it's about this moment and the future. And also, if you make mistakes, if it's all about like just... Be, <sighs> we're all going to make mad mistakes. I'm making mistakes every day and I, I have to keep... I'm apologising to people all the time for being too blunt and... or But like, it's just like... We're just, we're just, let's just be proud of who we are in this for this five minutes for trying our hardest. Yeah, we've incarnated in the latter day of the law. Yeah, literally two and a half, three thousand years from the Buddha. We chose to incarnate at the most difficult time. Without going super deep, every single, from what I'm learning, I'm going super deep on Santos right now. Every single timeline that's ever existed on every single reality, past, present and future, it goes into this moment right now. The zero timeline. This time that we're alive right now is the most fantastic, incredible, amazing. And all of you are so glorious and so beautiful and more powerful than you could ever truly imagine that uh, we need to start to believe this. We need to start to remember that we are the treasure tower because every time we doubt ourselves, we're slandering ourselves. Every time that we accept something that just doesn't make us feel like we're in tune with the warrior goddess that you are or the warrior king that you are, we're slandering ourselves. And light, there's so much light on this planet right now coming in, like literally from, this, like from the galactic sun, brrr, it's coming in so hard right now that we ha we, we, if we're making causes that aren't just pure, it's just us that are gonna suffer. We know that it's just gonna create an effect that's just not gonna be pure. It's just not gonna be the highest vibration that we can offer the universe. And that's fine, there's no judgment, but we can, we have the opportunity to be the best version of who we really could be. And um, there's many, like it says, I'm not claiming exclusive uh, to be exclusive with Namya Harenge Cure, but this is one of the most refined, and I know it will be the most refined practice I will ever find in this lifetime. Um, so yeah, let me read the guidance for today, and then we're gonna we're gonna chant. So September the twenty second, the principle that Buddhism equals life means that everything in one's life is itself Buddhism. The principle that Buddhism becomes manifest in society means that society too is one with Buddhism. The struggle for world peace can be waged only within the realities of life and society. Those who earnestly grapple with these realities develop strength and inner substance. They, they, they develop and grow. So what he's saying is, 
You think you want, you want to be a world leader? You, you want to be a light worker? You can't transcend. You can't go into some ashram and just disappear. It's in life. It's in the struggles of daily reality. It's being a Buddha in work. It's being the best version. Yes, King, I see you come in. It's being the best version of who you can be. Um, right here, right now. So, let's chant. Um, five minutes. And we're going to run over, so I'm sorry if anyone's got like an Uber waiting outside. You can love me and leave me. It's all blessed. But just thank you, man. It's, on, it's an honour to be a, a around 14 warriors. Nam yo ho renge kyo. 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 Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho 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 ringe kyo Ringe kyo nam yo ho ringe kyo nam yo ho ringe kyo 
Renge kyo nam yo ho 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 Renge kyo Wow definitely setting the intention it felt super powerful for me i felt like there was like a an orb running around me how how amazing are we man like seven weeks look at that like this is a i know big man big man that can't read this stuff yeah and this is like this is epic my dad couldn't read that not one no, there's not one man in my family there's not one masculine man in my family that could read none of this so i'm doing bits for my bloodline trust me um but yeah i just love you all all I see, and thank you for putting your cameras on, man, because I feel your energy. All I see is warriors and, 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 and angels and people that are trying their hardest to grapple with life and try their flipping hardest to fly. And I love you. So always, man, Joanna, Joanne, Angelina, Harley, JM, Amy. I want to say Naomi. I don't want to hope I'm not saying that wrong. Jamie, Sally Smith, Muna, uh, Celeste, JD, Maria, Kaya. I love you, man. Thank you for being here. Stay happy. Keep walking in just like your highest life state as much as possible. And sometimes if you need to scream into a pillow, if you'd like, just do that. And the most powerful thing I'm finding right now in all your relationships, whether it's um, uh, like sexual, um, family, however deep it is, to speak from your heart, man. Like, just be the most honest, authentic person. If you don't like something, if something's making you feel uncomfortable, if you feel anxious, if you're feeling jealous, if you're feeling paro, anything, speak from your heart. Because what have we got to lose, man? It's going to bring up the dirt. It's going to bring up the karma. And it, all problems happen because the causes we're making, often we're not just being ourselves. We don't even know ourselves. We're like, and, and we're just, just take it out of our head, man. Pull it out of our head. And, 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 and the people that resonate will resonate. If someone's not resonating, if someone doesn't accept you as you are, as a just truly just being a vulnerable being, then they are, they're no longer part of your path you send them away with absolute love because again they were part of your path so um gang 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 i love you stay happy eat some good food do what you're doing yes cares man my absolute warrior queen sister i love you um so thank you all of you and um yeah man we start the second half next week i'm, I'm what like 14 sessions maybe and we'll be done maybe i don't know but thank you and i love you take care guys Mwah, what warriors <laughs>